American lit. <laughs> All right, so. No offense, American lit. I think American lit. Just a couple of quick things uh, before we get started today. Um, so I'm sure most of you have probably seen your midterm grades by now. And let me just sort of explain what your midterm grade included, what's going on with it. Okay, so your midterm grade included uh, the midterm exam, the quizzes you've taken so far, the group presentation, if you've done it and, yet, and it's been graded, and by the way, second presentation group, some of you still need to get me your write-up of your group activity um, before I can actually do the grade. It included um, up to like the five possible response papers you could have done up to now, and it included a participation grade. Now, I will say, like, I tend to lowball people's participation grades a little bit at midterm. Uh, partly to give you a little bit of a kick in the ass to participate a little bit more. But where most of you are getting hung up is that too few of you are doing the response papers, right? There are several of you from whom I have not yet received one response paper. There are a couple who have only done maybe two, right? And this is really what's slowing you down and holding you back. So it, they're only one point each, right? So it seems like it's not very much, but they add up to 10 points, right? They add up to a full letter grade. So if you're not doing these, it's really gonna kind of drag you backwards. Now, I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the midterm exam, uh, which was graded, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some common issues that people had um, and to uh, sort of point out why certain things were graded the way they were graded, right? So as far as the essay questions were concerned, um, on question one, the one about uh, Gilgamesh and immortality, right? I was really looking for you to reference, as it says in the question, right, that Mesopotamian afterlife concepts and what that's like and how, it, how you know, ancient Mesopotamians balanced, you know, their view of this life and the afterlife and how that drives Gilgamesh's fear of death. So if you did not reference that fear of death, if you did not reference that afterlife concept, then you sort of lost points for that. I was also giving people extra points for referencing other similar ancient world afterlife concepts, right? So if you talked about similarities and differences between the Greek and Babylonian afterlives, that helped your grade a little bit. Um, as far as the second question was concerned, uh, most of you did all right uh, with this one, um, but I did give people extra points if they recalled the concepts of oikos, polis, and domus, right? Oikos and domus are the same thing, right? Oikos is the Greek word, domus is the Latin. Um, polis is the opposite of oikos, right? Does everybody remember what oikos means? It's the, ha right, the Greek concept of the household, right? Male on the outside facing parts of it, female on the inside parts of it. And the polis then is the public realm, right? The city. So people got extra, like, I didn't necessarily take points off if you didn't reference those things, but you got more points if you did. Um, but not very many of you tackled question three about cosmogonies, right? Creation myths. But a couple of you, when you did sort of forgot the context in which we talked about the book of Genesis and were looking at it from a specifically Christian perspective using specifically Christian concepts. Now I know this is an easy thing to kind of fall back into if it's the way you're used to looking at this text. But remember that we were looking at this as the product of the pre-Christian Israelite civilization who don't read all of those concepts quite the same way, right? right? For example, there was no devil in the ancient Israelite religion. The snake in the garden is just a snake. Right. You can't uh, be sort of reading backwards concepts onto a culture that that culture would not, have, would not have recognized or understood, right? There was no such thing as a Christian at the time the book of Genesis was actually written and compiled. So some of you lost some points uh, for that. Um, now, where people seem to have the most trouble was with the identifications. So I do, and this is a consistent issue with this exam, not just your class. Past classes have had a lot of trouble 
and this part of the midterm. So I just want to quickly go over the terms because I think, you know, I did try to choose things that are going to be important to remember going forward, right? Things I actually want you think, that have to do with things I want you actually thinking about. Um, so, ooh, <laughs> that was loud. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the muses. Okay, what are the muses? Okay, a daughter's of Zeus, and what do they represent? Yep, daughters of Zeus, goddesses of arts and sciences, good. And what text or texts will we find the muses in? Mm. Did the muses actually appear in the portion of the Odyssey that we read? No. Yeah, he sees it's Theogony. And I also gave people credit for Ovid's Metamorphoses because we didn't talk about it in class, but there is that portion of the Metamorphoses where the muses have that singing contest, right? So they do appear there. So I gave people credit for that, yes. Um, Polyphemus. Who or what is Polyphemus? Yes, is the Cyclops who shows no hospitality to Odysseus, right? Right? Eats his men. Gets drunk on wine. Barfs up sailors. So, what text is this then? The Odyssey. Yeah, Homer, the Odyssey. Right. Good. Okay, continuing on. What is a Junsi? Yes, this is the Confucian concept of the gentleman, right? And the text is called, like, most of you got the author right. Most of you got Confucius, or that it's attributed to Confucius. What's the text actually called? The Analects, yes. This, a lot of you blanked on. All right. What is, a lot of you had trouble with this. What is the Yahwist? I thought it was early, early author. But, uh, no, I'm just no go, go ahead. Keep talking. I thought it was the, one of the four authors of the Bible. Of the, of, like, um, of the. Yes. The Yahwist is one of four authors of the first five books of the Bible. And how do we recognize the Yahwist? How do we distinguish the Yahwist from the other three? Okay, yeah, they use the YHWH uh, as the name for God. And what else is distinctive about the Yahwist? They, they portray God as being very human-like. Okay, yeah, very human-like, anthropomorphic God, good. And at what sort of level of development would the Israelite religion have been when the Yahweh was writing? Basics. Pardon? Uh, with the Yahweh, it would have been towards the beginning. It would have been very developed. Yeah, it would have been sort of in that kind of fertility religion stage, right? Similar to other ancient Mediterranean religions. So, right, so with the Yahweh, we're talking about Genesis, and because. We don't really know who wrote any of these books, right? The author would be anonymous here. Okay, so, continuing on. This one, most of you got. Who's Jason? A husband. Okay, yes, Jason, right? The rat-like ex-husband. <laughs> And so the text, Medea, and the author, Euripides. Euripides, good. Okay, Shamhat. Most of you who attempted this one also got it. Yes, the divine prostitute of Ishtar, and what does she do? Yep, yep she humanizes Enkidu.
Okay, so text is Epic of Gilgamesh. And author is who the hell knows. <laughs> All right. Adonis. Who is Adonis? Um, Aphrodite's lover, who was born of the family line of the statue. And, mm -hmm. and, and he got killed um, hunting. Yes, those are pretty much all the details of Adonis's life, right? All right, lover of Venus. All right, unnatural birth from statue line. All right, gourd in testicles by boar. And what text is this from? Yes, and the author? Ovid, good. Now, this one most of you missed when you attempted it. Day. What text does this come from? The Tao Te Ching. Okay, yeah. This is from the Tao Te Ching. <laughs> And the author, or the assumed author, is uh, Lao Tzu. Okay. And what does day mean? The way the way. The truth. That's the, the truth. Day does not mean the way. Tao is the way, right? This was where a lot of you got mixed up. A lot of you confused day and Tao, right? Tao is the way. Day <laughs> means excellence or power, and day is the kind of spiritual power that you accumulate by following the way. All right, all of this emptying of yourself to, you know, allow yourself to you be know, a to create potential within the self, right? What you're then filling it with is day. What you're filling it with is this power that you get from following the way. All right, last set. What's catharsis? The, like, it's like the purging of like, feelings and emotions that you do when you're watching like, a play. Yes, catharsis literally means purging, typically of negative emotions, also with negative people, right? And what play would this then most closely relate to? What text does this most closely relate to? What sorts of texts Lydia were designed? Tragedy. Yeah, exactly, yeah, so tragedy. Greek tragedy was supposed to evoke catharsis, right? That was the goal of the Greek tragedy. So yeah, the, what I was looking for here was Medea. Who's Kinesius? The husband of the woman that <clears throat> Yes, Kinesius, right, is the husband of Marine in Lysistrata, right? Who shows up with the unwashed, unfed baby, all the housework undone, and enormously sexually frustrated, right? Yeah. Alright, so we already gave you the name of the text, right? It's Lysistrata. Who's the author? Aristophanes, yes. All right. Last two. What is Li? L I. Yeah, social behavior is part of it, right? Literally, Lee translates to ritual, but it refers to the whole range of appropriate social behaviors. In what belief system? Yeah, Confucianism, right? So we're talking here about the Analects again. All right, and last one, 
Who is Utanapishtim? Yeah, he's the immortal human, the flood myth hero, right, in Gilgamesh, who Gilgamesh goes to visit to ask for immortality, yeah. And so the end, no, you, you don't really want that. No, it's not such a good thing, really. All right, so if any of you have any questions about the exam later on, please do feel free to come and ask me, right? I have your exams to give back to you at the end of class. Um, but I did just sort of want to go over the stuff that people missed so that um, when this stuff comes back, which it always does, um, you are maybe better prepared for it. Um, we'll talk a little bit at some point about how to sort of better make the, the identification terms stick when you're studying as well. Okay, so. How many of you have any prior experience with the Quran or with portions of the Quran? Okay, that's two of you. <laughs> All right, so for those of you for whom this was completely new, um, how did it go for you? What did you think? Mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, um, he, he, uh, he, here's the thing: is that we we see the same thing though in those first five books of the Bible, right? Like the whole book of Leviticus is taken up almost with you know punishments for what seem to us like minor infractions, like uh, you know wearing blended fabrics um, or not putting your wife in a tent in the backyard when she's menstruating, right? It's, you, know, there, you know, all sorts of purity and cleanliness rules. And yeah, um, this is, well, a, a lot of what we get here is about kind of, you know, purity rules, ritual behavior. Now, I think, um, well, let me ask you this, like, do you see any kind of story here? Is there any kind of narrative here? No. no. Yeah, the, the Quran is different from most of the books of the Bible in that it is not narrative. Right? What the Quran purports to be is a series of revelations delivered to Muhammad Ibn Abdallah, that's his full name, Born around, nine, uh, around 570, died in 632, me thinks. So it's a series of revelations. Yes, it's a series of revelations that <clears throat> Muhammad supposedly received from the angel Jibreel. And Jibreel is just the, it's the Arabic spelling of the Hebrew name Gabriel. So the angel of the Annunciation in the Gospels, right, is the same angel that delivers this message to Muhammad. And one thing to note about um, Muhammad um, in Islam, right, is the word prophet is never actually used in the Quran to refer to him. The, word, the Arabic word for prophet is nabi. And it is always used in reference to the Hebrew prophets of the past, right? Muhammad is regarded by Muslims as one, as the last in a line of divinely inspired messengers. The past messengers are the Nabi, right? And this includes as I said, all of the old Hebrew prophets, right? It includes Moses, Elijah, Elisha, King David is included in their list, King Solomon, um, Jesus and Mary are both regarded as Nabi. Um, the Islamic concept of Jesus is quite different though from the Christian concept. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's actually mentioned in the portion that you read for today. 
Um, the word that is actually usually used to refer to Muhammad is Rasul. And Rasul means messenger. <coughs> Now, what is contained within this word, though, is not just to the idea of somebody who delivers messages back and forth between people or between humans and the divine, right? A rasul is a combination prophets, statesmen, priest, king, whatever else, right? So the Rasul has political and spiritual functions, as military functions, while the Rasul is also a general, right? So Rasul is more of a kind of all-purpose, all-encompassing term than Nabi is. And this is the word that is typically used to refer to, refer to Muhammad, not prophet, right? Messenger. All right, so what else did you guys get out of this? Anything that's surpri that particularly surprised or confused you? What is right within the Islam mm -hmm. religion, but what is right with the Jewish and the Christian it talks about the Torah and calls the Christians the people of the book. Yeah. Um, does anybody know what that whole people of the book thing is about? Okay. So Islam is the youngest of what are called the Abrahamic religions. Right. The three major Abrahamic religions in order of age are Christianity, which is currently practiced by about 32% of the world's population, <coughs> Judaism, currently practiced by uh, roughly 0.2%, of the world's population. There are 14 million Jews worldwide. That sounds like a lot, but not in terms of the actual population of the globe, right? Judaism has a cultural influence that outweighs its actual numbers. And Islam, which is practiced by about 26% of the world's population. So there are almost as many Muslims in the world as there are Christians. Um, Islam, as I said, is the youngest of these religions. They all regard Abraham, who made the covenant with God in the, uh, <clears throat> in the book of Genesis, right? And was told he would be the father of nations as their ancestor. Yeah, Corey. So is the other percent, like, not studying, or are they just other religions? We're just talking about other religions there. I think 15% um, of the world's population are Hindu, 7% are Buddhist, um, and then the, yeah, there, there are others as well, right? And these aren't even the only three Abrahamic religions. There are other offshoots um, that are much smaller. For example, uh, the uh, Yazidis uh, in Kurdistan, right? So, you know, the Kurdish areas of Turkey and um, Iraq. And... Uh, we won't belabor that because I don't want to go too far afield here, but the Yazidis actually have some interesting belief and pretend, and pretend, to, be, pretend to be outwardly Muslim to avoid persecution. But I digress. Okay, so Christians, Jews, and a group called the Sabians. We don't actually know all that much about who the Sabians were are referred to as people of the book. Now, these are groups that the Muslims regard as having received revelations from God in the past. Right? They regard certain texts revered by Jews and Christians as sacred as well. Right? So, they revere the Torah, right, those first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Psalms, and the Gospels. 
but they believe that previous groups who received these revelations got them mixed up, right? Made mistakes. That there are errors in transmission from God's original message is expressed in these texts and what God actually intended. Yes, Sarah? Didn't they kind of say that in the story? Like, yeah. They, like, don't believe everything that the Christians say or something? I remember reading it, part of it. Yeah, and, and there, there, there are certain po there, in certain ways you are supposed to respect the peoples of the book, and they were given um, a lot more freedom in Muslim territories than, um, say, people who did not follow an Abrahamic religion. But they are also constantly referring to what they believe are the errors that the peoples of the book have made, and the ways in which they have corrupted the message over time, right? that the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospels were each intended to correct, like, the Psalms were intended to correct the Torah, the Gospels were intended to correct the Psalms, and the Quran has now come as God's final revelation to his people to correct the mistakes that were made by previous generations, right? So they do regard the Quran as the final revelation of God to creation, right? Like, kind of like, this time get it right, you assholes moment, right? So it's, <clears throat> so some of the restrictions placed upon these peoples of the book, right? Because they, they, there's a kinship recognized, but there's also a recognition that from a Muslim point of view, the various peoples of the book are misguided, right? That they have followed corrupted teachings in an incorrect path, right? And again, I say this like from a Muslim point of view, that is, that's what the Quran says. Now, does it seem weird to you? I mean, this is only the fifth chapter of the Quran. Does it seem weird to you that only the fifth chapter would be so focused on things like ritual purity rules. No. Why not? Because it's already like stinging off of the other Okay, yeah, it, it's, it's already influenced by previous religious traditions, right? Mm -hmm. right. I would have led with the purity rules and stuff personally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first four uh -huh. parts might have another purpose I've never read. Sure, right. sure. Right. Well, and yeah, if, if we look at, like, the way the Quran is organized um, might look a little bit strange um, to, some, to an unfamiliar reader, right? It's not organized chronologically. It's not organized as a narrative, right? Excuse me, there is no story. There is no narrative. Each chapter is called a surah. There are 114, I think, surahs. And let me just double check what exactly surah means. Because I can't remember off the top of my head. Right. Surah means something like revelation. But I couldn't remember what the hell it means because it doesn't translate directly into English. Right, it's one of those words like Jinsi. So the Suras were composed over a 20 year period. Muhammad started receiving visions at about age 40, right? So around the year 610. <coughs> and continued receiving visions for 20 years after that. Some of the visions he experienced in his hometown of Mecca, this is where his earliest visions come from, and also what are typically the shortest. This is Muhammad's visions? Yeah. And the, the, the shorter ones are actually a lot less focused on rules. 
and much more focused on sort of like basic principles of belief and doctrine. The longer Soras were composed mostly while he was in exile in a city called Medina, to which he and his supporters had been invited uh, when they were essentially kicked out of Mecca. As they were given a home in Medina, and he received the longer visions while in Medina. Uh, the one that you read for today, the feast, is one of the Medina visions, right? So the reason that that is placed so early, even though chronologically it occurred later in Muhammad's career, is because the surahs are actually arranged according to length. With the exception of the opening, the longest surahs come first. And then each surah after is progressively shorter. Why did you find the title funny? It's called The Feast, and it does discuss how, like, this is what is lawful to eat. Uh-huh. you're allowed to consume, and then it yeah. leaves that and goes into the whole eye for an eye. This is how you punish a thief. Yeah. Well, and, and that, that's another, um, another thing about the Quran generally that kind of defies a lot of Western literary conventions. Um, the surahs aren't actually named for their subjects, right? So yeah, while this does talk a little bit about dietary laws and what it is lawful and what it is not lawful to eat, primarily, like, where the name primarily comes from is the image near the end of it of God setting a feast for his people, right? So the names of the surahs usually come from a particular, like a particular arresting image in that surah or a, you know, a character whose life is discussed in that sora, right? There's no narrative function, and it's not, it's not even necessarily a clue as to the content. So and this is one of the reasons why a lot of Western readers have trouble with the Quran, is it doesn't give us the kinds of signposts that we're used to, um, to aid in understanding. Now, just to get back to where it was as far as the way the, um, the surahs are arranged. Um, they're arranged in a way actually that is supposed to be um, an aid to memorization. You actually start when you are learning to recite from the Quran with the short surahs at the end that are all arranged together. And then as you learn and master the material, you tackle the longer surahs at the beginning, right? So it's a way of sort of keeping together the portions you're supposed to memorize at various stages of your, <clears throat> yeah, above your life and belief, right? All right, so any questions so far? Any comments so far? Okay, well then let's start digging into this a little bit and we'll look at the ways in which Islamic belief then sort of departs from perhaps more familiar Christian and Jewish tropes that we would, be, that, that we would recognize, right? So let's start on page 74. Can I get um, a volunteer to read starting from You Who Believe? Okay, you can stop there. Okay, so what 
what's the big important focus of this paragraph? What's the big thing it's telling you not to do? Don't hunt while you're on pilgrimage, right? Why not? Why should you not hunt when you're on pilgrimage? Because God says not to. Okay. <laughs> At the most basic level, right? Yes. But there is a logic to this. Right? Essentially, if you're not supposed to go hunting game while you're on a pilgrimage, what does that then suggest you're really not, you're really not supposed to be doing when you're on a pilgrimage? Eat. You can eat. Yeah. No, you're, you're not supposed to be killing. But it says you can fish later on. Yeah, they don't regard fishing as it's being quite hard. the same sort of thing. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I guess that you know the, the fish kind of dies on its own. Fish out of the water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's all your fault. <laughs> it it is. I'll grant it. Yeah, but the the injunction here really is mostly against killing while you're on pilgrimage. Um, right, going to the pilgrimage site with blood on your hands puts you in a state of ritual impurity, right? You can't approach the sacred mosque with blood on your hands. So it's an injunction against killing. Now, if we continue on, can I get somebody to read from you are forbidden to eat carrion? You are forbidden to eat carrion, carrion thank you. blood, pigs, meat, any animal over which any name other than God's has been enclosed, any animal strangled or victim of a violent blow or fall, or gored or savaged by a beast of prey, unless you still slaughter it in the correct manner. Or anything sacrificed on idolatrous, idolatrous, idolatrous. Oh, thank you, mm -hmm. idolatrous. You are also forbidden to allot shares of meat by drawing marked arrows. A heinous, a heinous practice today. The disbelievers have lost all hope that you would give up your religion. Do not fear them. Fear me. Today I have perfected your religion for you, completed my blessings upon you, and chosen as your religion Islam, total devotion to God. But if any of you is forced by him to eat forbidden food with no intention of doing wrong, then God is most forgiving and merciful. Okay, thank you. Okay, so much of what is said here at the beginning of this paragraph lines up with Jewish dietary law, or what we call kosher law. You know, the injunction against eating blood, right? The first time, like, I, I, have, a, I have a lot of Jewish friends, and the first time I ever saw someone eat a well-done steak... Um, it was a, I was having dinner with a friend in college, like, like <laughs> it's like a hockey puck. Why are you eating it? It's all, well, I'm not supposed to eat blood, you know. That's so yeah, no blood, no carrion, right? So you know, no eating roadkill. <laughs> any animal over which any name other than God's has been evoked, any animal strangled or victim of a violent blow or fall or gored or savaged by a beast of prey, unless you still slaughter in the in the correct manner. So. The injunction there is against uh, cruelty, right? The injunction there is to treat animals that you are going to eat humanely before you eat them, right? There is a particular, um, in both uh, sort of kosher is the Jewish version, halal is the Islamic version. They follow very similar rules. Um, and there's a particular way in which you are supposed to slaughter an animal that is supposed to sort of reduce its pain and suffering um, in the process. But I think the really the big thing here, any animal over which any name other than God's has been invoked, anything sacrificed on idolatrous altars, um, anything allotted by drawing marked arrows, what are the kinds of practices that he's referring to here? Practices from the previous, previous so, not civilization, but <laughs> yes, pre pre-Islamic Arabian practices. Yes, he's talking. <laughs> yeah, he, exactly. Yeah, he's talking about pagan practices, right? Or what he would regard as pagan practices, right? Don't eat any meat that has been involved in some sort of pagan ritual. Uh -huh. I saw that. You know, when you go to the deli, you pull your little tab, and it's got a marked error on it. So I, was, <laughs> I, I think that's just coincidence. I know. But, <laughs> but that's what it came when I read it. I was like, I do that when I go to the deli. I but you know, he, he talks about this whole drawing lots thing later on as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what the issue is there seems to be like, is an attitude towards chance and towards fortune. 
Right? It's not just that this is a pagan practice. Right? There are injunctions that like this comes later in an injunction against gambling. Right? And yeah, Larry, go ahead. So essentially is that like a thing against like you said, gambling stuff because it's like a slap in the face of God because God's supposed to deliver everything for me. In a way, yeah, that's actually really close. Um, this is one area where the Islamic concept of God differs from the Jewish and Christian concept of God. Right? In Judaism and Christianity, um, creation is by and large regarded as a finished act. Right? God created the world, put human beings in it, and it is then up to them to follow the rules or not. Right? It is up to human beings to do what they will. The Islamic God concept uh, works rather differently. Um, creation is an ongoing process in Islam, right? The world is constantly being created and recreated. And nothing can happen unless God allows it to happen. Yeah, go ahead. Is that one? I don't know if it's true or not, but I had heard that like, in some Islamic countries, that's why you can't like, depict pictures of like, animals. Okay, um, that's actually, um, they take the, the biblical injunction against idolatry really, really seriously. Um, and if everything in the created world is an image of God, right, is made by God, then to create pictures, to create false representations of all of God's creatures is an act of idolatry. So yeah, you will rarely find, um, particularly in Arabic texts, any kind of pictorial representation of people or of animals. In, in Islamic countries that already had traditions of pictorial art, like for example when Islam spreads to Persia, those traditions persist. Right? You will still find um, in post-Islamic Persia, um, you know, paintings of you know sort of people sitting in verandas and you know, eating sherbet and things of that nature. Um, you know, riding elephants to war and whatnot. Um, you will typically not find those in Arabic texts. So they actually kind of sublimate then that artistic impulse into producing beautiful calligraphy. Right? <clears throat> the artistic energy that they would have spent on making pictures of things, they instead spend on making the words on the page look beautiful. So I mean, if you've ever, um, if you ever get a chance to, get, I mean, I know that uh, I'm a little bit sort of spoiled for this sort of thing. I, I went, I went to graduate school in D.C. There were lots of great free museums, so you know, I went to several exhibits where they were showing off, um, you know, say like medieval copies of the Quran, you know, where they had like this, this incredibly beautiful uh, calligraphy. So if you ever, if you ever get a chance to see something like that, give it a shot. It's really something. But. Yeah, uh, where was I going with this? I was talking about how Allah differs from Yahweh Adonai Elohim, right? So, nothing can happen unless Allah allows it to happen. If you do something wrong, it is because Allah allowed you to do that wrong thing. If you think any particular thing, it's because Allah allowed that thought to pop into your head. Nothing in the world happens without Allah's say so or permission. So there is no chance, right? There is no such thing as luck or fortune. This is why there are those injunctions against gambling and divination and things of that nature, right? Okay. Other questions you guys have about this or observations you have about it before? Why? Because the, the, the Jewish people, they also, well, I mean, I imagine the Muslims have the injunction mm -hmm. against faith because the Jews did. Why do people hate the faith? Because they're dirty animals. 
Okay, pigs actually get a bad rap. Um, the reason pigs wallow, pigs are actually clean and industrious and quite intelligent. Um, they wallow in mud because they don't have sweat glands. That's how they cool off. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, the reason they are regarded as unclean animals in Judaism and Islam is because they're carrion eaters. This is the same reason why, like, for example, like a lot of different kinds of seafood are not kosher. Right? It's because they're like shellfish, for example, or bottom feeders. It's because they eat garbage that um, the Jews won't eat them. Right? Yeah. Sometimes also these kinds of rules are intended to kind of set a group that regards itself as chosen apart from other neighboring groups. Right? So we have been given a special set of rules to live by. We are kind of specially like a lot of the rules you see, for example, um, in the book of Leviticus are direct um, responses to um, pagan practices that were common in the Mediterranean at the time, right? That's telling the Jews not to do those things because you are not like these other people who do them. All right, so yes, so that that's, that's what's going on with but yeah, pigs are pigs are forbidden uh, because they're carrion eaters. It's very hard to do Christmas ham. Because <laughs> <laughs> cows are uh, Sam doesn't eat doesn't eat pork, so yeah. I don't eat, um, I don't know. cows are actually good dummies. Uh, <laughs> I I I generally just try not to think about what I'm eating. <laughs> Learned a long time ago. Don't think too hard about what's in your food. Yeah, that's you know well. Mm -hmm. you know, but you know, yeah. This, 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 I mean, this, this is another thing. Like, we don't, we don't live nearly as close to our. Like, when we talked about, you know, the way, you know, the Greeks talked so sort of openly about um, sex and violence, right? We live a lot further generally from everyday sex and violence than previous generations would have, right? You know, like our food comes shrink wrapped in the supermarket. We don't generally have to go out and kill it. Um, right, so where do we want to continue with this? Okay, right, so another thing to note generally about the language of the Quran, right? I'm going to give you an example here on page uh, 75. God took a pledge from the children of Israel. We made 12 leaders arise among them, and God said, I am with you if you keep up the prayer pay the prescribed alms, believe in my messengers and support them, and lend God a good loan, I will wipe out your sins and admit you into gardens grace with flowing streams. Anything strike you as unusual about this language? Do you notice any kind of pattern here in the language? What does it sound like? Yeah. It sounds like a business contract, right? Yeah, there's extremely modern things about the way this is written in comparison to um, the previous Abraham. Oh, sure. This, the well, this, this is much closer to us in time. I mean, right? This is you well, seventh century CE. This, this is seems much more specifically building a religion, like whoever. Mm -hmm. Ended, ended up, whoever actually wrote the Quran was very intentionally putting together a mm -hmm. very specific religion, whereas the Torah and the Gospels and all that, those still feel like just the stories, you know? Right, that are then compiled yeah, that as, the, as, 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 as the religion takes shape and the rules form, yeah. Um, like, he's clearly talking about time. Yeah. There are, act, there are, by the way, also, I think I mentioned this, if any of you managed to watch the video lecture I sent you about Augustine, there are, way, there are far more Gospels than there are actually in the Bible. There are a whole bunch of sort of unofficial Gospels that the church does not recognize um, for various reasons. And if you, have any, hey, hey, if you ever have any questions about those, feel free to come ask. But um, Right. Um, this is framed in kind of contract language for a very specific reason. Does anybody know what Muhammad's profession was before he started receiving revelations? Was he a lawyer? He was not a lawyer. Was he a banker? He was a merchant. Yes, he was actually a fairly successful trader. And 
the earliest converts to Islam were merchants, other merchants. And so he frames much of the Quran in a kind of business language, right? God keeps an account book, right? You give God your soul in pledge. And he decides whether you've kept up your end of the bargain at the end, right? A lot of the sort of language of balance as well, right? This comes from a sort of business mindset, a kind of business concept. So yeah, so in a lot of ways, yeah, this, this is being set up from the beginning as a kind of businessman's religion. Yeah, yeah. He, he specifically were talking, referring there to the twelve tribes of the Jews. Yeah, um, that is a specific reference to that. All right. <clears throat> so, just a little bit more background information for you here uh, before we continue looking directly at the text. So, here's what we know about the formation of it, right? So I already told you a little bit about the way it's assembled and the difference between the early suras composed in Mecca and the later suras composed in Medina, right? So the earliest known Quran ma manuscript, it's called the Birmingham Quran. And carbon dating has placed it somewhere between 568 and 645 CE. Right? It's called the Birmingham Quran because it just it happens to be located in the library at the University of Birmingham in England. Right? That's the collection it's part of. So it was probably put together shortly after Muhammad's death. It's kind of right in that window of time, but he died in 632. Um, it's highly unlikely that the date is as early as 568, given that he was born in 570. Um, and there is little evidence that he was actually sort of coalescing existing trends in the region when he started his ministry. Now, at the time that Muhammad was born, the Arabian Peninsula, which kind of looks like this, with, okay, here's Turkey off over here, and Persian Gulf, Persian land pass off of really, you know, I, yeah, I, hey, I, I have explained various times the, how, that I'm a shitty artist, right? I can't, I can't draw. Um, so over on this side, on the, on the west, you had the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire was the successor to the Roman Empire. It was predominantly Christian, um, but culturally uh, heavily influenced by the Greeks. On the other side, you had the Sassanid Empire. Right, the Persians. And they predominantly practiced a religion called Zoroastrianism. Anybody know anything about Zoroastrianism? It's a, it's a dual kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very, very ancient uh, dualistic religion. Um, and what I mean by dualistic is it essentially believes that the powers of good and evil um, are evenly matched in the universe and are sort of constantly tugging back and forth. Um, <clears throat> Uh, is Zoroastrianism where the whole whirling dervish thing comes from? Um, no. Uh, dervishes are typically Muslim, 
Oh. Um, they practice a sort of um, a form of kind of like uh, ecstatic Islam, or they they get themselves worked up into a sort of frenzied mystical state. Um, but yeah, they're probably continuing a practice that predates Islam. So the Arabian Peninsula here, where Islam first takes shape, is on the one hand in the middle of very important trade routes. Mecca in particular was a huge trading city. It's also right in between two large and powerful empires that don't like each other very much and are always sort of battling back and forth for territory. So a lot of the Arabian tribes developed strong military traditions um, in the interest of self-defense, right, in order to not be subsumed by either of these larger empires. It's sort of similar to it's, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the Swiss attitude towards neutrality, right? Switzerland has traditionally always been neutral because it's sandwiched right between France, Germany, and Austria and Italy, right? All of which traditionally have not got along all that well, and all of which might like to annex Little Mountain Kingdom, right? So we develop a strong military tradition and we remain neutral so that nobody comes after us. Right, so, again, mild digression. Why do I keep doing that today? Um, <clears throat> so, religiously, in Arabia at the time, there were large numbers of Christians, large numbers of Jews, and large numbers of, I guess, you know, what we would call um, animists, people who worshipped um, natural forces sort of often in the shape of, you know, a god or a sort of cult object, right? Uh, Muhammad's family controlled one of the, uh, the animist cult centers. Um, how many of you know what the Kaaba is? The stone in the yeah, it's um, it's it, yeah, it's a, it's a shrine in the center of a great big square in Mecca, right? Have you ever seen pictures of people on the Hajj, the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca? You'll see like you know thousands and thousands of people milling around this little square building. That's the Kaaba, and before Islam, the Kaaba was a very important um, sort of pagan cult center. And Muhammad's tribe, the Quraysh, controlled it. Though it was his own tribe that really sort of uh, turned against and rejected him when he began preaching because the sorts of things he was preaching were a danger to their livelihood and to the religion that they protected, right? So when he returns from Medina to Mecca, he repurposes the Kaaba, and it becomes one of the most sacred sites in, in Islam. It becomes actually sort of the center of one of uh, what are called the five pillars of Islam. Right, these are five things that any believing Muslim must do if possible. Right. Number one is, I can't remember the Arabic names, really. it's Salat, or prayer. Every day, five times a day, you are supposed to pray facing Mecca, right? So you, you know, put down the prayer mat, and you kneel, and you bow to Mecca, and you pray. That's uh, what I was playing for you at the beginning of the big, uh, beginning of class. Was a call was the Muslim call to prayer. Um, it's done by um, okay. They call him they call him a muezzin, right? It's his job to essentially, in a city, typically go up into a tower, 
up above the mosque and give out the call and then people are supposed to stop what they're doing and either come to the mosque to pray or pray wherever they happen to be. Um, the one that uh, I was uh, playing for you, it's uh, by an Australian muezzin um, who was standing on top of a mountain while he was giving. So that actually sort of, that sort of lovely echoing effect was from that. So that's Salat, prayers. The second is Zakat, or almsgiving. Right, you are supposed to donate a certain percentage of your income to the needy. Right, so you give some of your money for the upkeep of the for the upkeep of the community or for the upkeep of the poor. The third, Ramadan. Fasting. Right, fasting during the holy month, and you know they they don't fast for the whole month, right. They don't spend a whole month not eating, right? No one, no one would do that. No, it's just, um, it's, it's just for it's just from sun up to sundown. Yes, during the holy month. Once the sun goes down, you can eat something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're supposed to eat eat simple meals. Yeah, and the, and and during the during the day, you can have water to keep yourself hydrated, right? I mean, you know, that that's you know one thing that's noted, right? Even at the begin at the end of the second paragraph, right? They tell you they. You know, they talk about all the forbidden foods, right, the things you're not supposed to eat, but it's like, but look, if you're going to starve to death, right, then please just eat something, right? The fourth, right, is the Hajj, or pilgrimage. If you are able, at least once in your life, you are supposed to make the pilgrimage to the sacred city of Mecca, and you are supposed to walk around the Kaaba with all of the other pilgrims, right? Get, trying to get as close to the Kaaba as you can to touch it if possible. Now, the Hajj is one of those, like, like, if you're actually physically unable to get to Mecca for whatever reason, whether because of illness or disability, um, lack of money, you know, what have you, you know, the danger of the journey, right? There are other things you can do in place of that. Pardon? It's um, where I was reading, because this is what my group's talking about, uh -huh. is uh, if you're not able to make the pilgrimage, you're supposed mm -hmm. to fast for three days. Yeah. Yeah, there, right, there, there, there's, there's just about always, like, like, if you are, for whatever reason, compelled to not do one of these things, there are often ways you can make up for it. Again, sort of very businesslike in that way. And the final pillar is Shahada. This is the declaration of faith. And this is just sort of the simple recitation of um, a prayer, so you know, declaring your faith in Allah, that there is no God but Allah, that you acknowledge um, his supremacy, right? And reciting the Shahada, you know, sincerely with meaning in your heart in Arabic um, is sort of what makes you, a, like, you have to do that in order to become a Muslim, right? That's actually kind of step one. Um, okay, so these are the basics here, right? I gave you a little bit of historical context. What else do you guys want to know about this? Or what else has got you a little bit uh, mixed up about this? What, where else in the text that you read? Like, oh, you know, um, here's something um, we can do. This actually relates to what you were saying earlier, uh, Daisha, about um, pictorial representation and idolatry. Right? Let's look at the bottom here of page 75. When he continues talking about people of the book, can I get somebody to read from people of the book? Are you going to volunteer? Yeah, Tessa, go for it. People of the book, our messenger has come to make clear to you much of what you have kept hidden of the scripture and to overlook much you have done. A light has now come to you from God and a scripture making things clear with which God guides to the ways of peace those who follow what pleases him, mm -hmm. bringing them from darkness out into light by his will and guiding them to a straight path. Those who say God is the Messiah, the Son of Mary, are defying the truth. 
say, if it had been God's will, mm -hmm. could, anyone, could anyone have prevented him from destroying the Messiah's son of Mary, together with his mother and everyone else on earth, to control the heavens and the earth and all that is between them belongs to God? He creates whatever he will. God has power over everything. Okay, thank you very much. Now, what's being pointed out here is the primary difference between Christian belief and Islamic belief, right? Central to Christian belief is the idea that God took human form in Jesus, right? That, you know, he was born, you know, that Jesus and God are, to some extent, one and the same, right? In Islam, a human being cannot be God. The idea of a human being being divine is considered blasphemous and idolatrous. So they regard Jesus as a Nabi, right, as a prophet, and his mother Mary as well but they do not regard Jesus as divine. They even acknowledge Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, but they do not acknowledge him as being the son of God or as being God, right? Because they say a human being cannot be God. Human beings are limited. Human beings are finite. God is not. Right, so by their logic, it is impossible for God to take human form. That's like the one thing God can't do. Or won't do, anyway. All right, other questions about this? What do they keep? Like, why do they refer to Allah as God? Why don't they just say Allah? Um, well, in the Arabic, they do say Allah. Okay. <laughs> God is just the translation. Yeah, in fact, you know, the, the word Allah is etymologically related to Elohim. Does anybody remember what Elohim means from when we talked about the Hebrew Bible? Yeah, there's the Elohist, right? who refers to God as Elohim. And Elohim is a kind of generic um, Western Semitic term for a god. It's like lowercase g god, not like capital G god. Yeah, although, you know, the Elohist is using it sort of capital G, right? Yeah. And this itself, El what Elohim means is child of El. And El is the ancient father god of the Canaanites, right? The people who were dwelling in sort of what is now Israel and Lebanon when the Hebrews arrived there, when the Israelites first arrived there. So yeah, all of these names are etymologically related to each other. Arabic is very closely related um, to, uh, to Hebrew, which is probably, I heard somebody talking about, you know, the uh, how similar the call to prayer sounds to, you know, certain Jewish prayers that are sung in the synagogue. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, they're coming out of very similar traditions. You're coming out of more or less the same part of the world, right? They're both Abrahamic faiths, and they both remained, uh, to some extent, for a relatively long time, uh, local religions, as opposed to Christianity, which spread far from its place of origin um, fairly early, thanks to being kind of right in the middle of the Roman Empire, and really kind of focused more on places outside of its place of origin than actually sort of building up a presence in the Middle East. Um, right, I guess, does anybody have any other questions or comments here? something about the Byzantine Empire. It's okay. like one of the kings had like children and like but he had only like daughters. Okay. And then his daughter was like set to be like the queen or something. And uh -huh. 
he had like a son, a baby son, right before he died, and then like she tried to poison him, and then they like exiled her. Yeah, they, that. That, that is a story I don't know, but it actually uh, sounds pretty typical. Uh, royal families traditionally have not engendered much warmth amongst each other. Um, when every sibling is a potential rival claimant, um, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine um, how you would uh, how you would get along. And they made her go to like a monastery and become a monk. That also sounds pretty typical. Yeah. All right, so for next time, you're going to be reading some selections from uh, Dante's Inferno. I have uh, reading questions here for you. Uh